Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to invite you to this year's Bone Award Lecture. I'm Bill McDonough, the president of the Volcanology, Geochemistry, and Petrology section of AGU. And it is my distinguished, truly distinguished honor to recognize our two Bowen medalists. We will have two lectures, each taking an hour period of time and including the citations. We will start with the first lecture being given by the awardee Bernard Marti. Bernard? The plaque, which I think is quite respectable, reads, the 2017 Norman L. Bowen Award presented to Bernard Marti for outstanding contributions to volcanology, geochemistry, or petrology by the VGP section. Congratulations, Bernard. The citation for Bernard will be given by Chris Ballantyne. Thank you, Bill. Well, nothing gives me, uh, nothing gives me uh, greater pleasure than, than, than seeing someone so deserving of, of such a high award. Um, Bernard Marti's career in geochemistry is broadly defined by three clear threads. The first is the study of the origin and processing of volatile elements in the terrestrial mantle. The second is the character and processes controlling the Archean terrestrial atmosphere. And the third and most recent is the origin and character of volatiles in prim primitive solar system materials. The, synth the synthesis of these three strands is probably the most major contribution we've seen to understanding volatile origin and the origin of volatiles in our planet since probably Brown wrote his classic paper in 1949 determining that the, the Earth's atmosphere was secondary in origin. This is just fundamental great science. Let me spend just a few minutes highlighting some of the key points in each of those areas before I finish. Bernard's earliest work established the relationship between helium-3 and carbon in Earth's mantle and used the argon isotopic composition to resolve the terrestrial mantle nitrogen isotopic value from shallow air contamination. Fundamentally, this work enabled subsequent estimates of carbon and nitrogen flux into and out of the terrestrial mantle and provide the go-to references still today for this field. He provided the first evidence with neon isotopes that the plume source volatiles can have a solar nebula component contrasting with the upper mantle, which likely have a chondritic origin. This series of papers defining the origin of volatile elements and their origin in the mantle are all citation classics. Bernard's second strand has developed by studying samples that preserve wisps of the Archean atmosphere in some of the most ancient minerals we have to hand. Determining the Archean nitrogen isotopic composition that directly addresses early atmosphere composition and planetary mass balance. His group have also pr produced a series of papers with compelling new xenon isotopic observations that provide a solution to the extreme xenon isotopic, uh, isotopic anomalies and low abundance in Earth's atmosphere relative to other noble gases. This discovery makes redundant the long-held idea that the Earth needs a hidden xenon reservoir and makes us fundamentally address the processes that have controlled the evolution of our atmosphere since it formed, raising some significant questions. The third strand of Bernard Marti's effort has resulted in a series of work that together, together illuminates the processes controlling planetary body volatile acquisition in the earliest stages of solar system formation. These include Genesis mission samples that provide the definitive solar nitrogen isotopic composition, showing this to be far more depleted in 15 nitrogen relative to 14, compared with comets, the inner planets, or meteorites. Fundamental process information. Stardust samples from Comet 81P 
Wild 2, that show the volatile origin of some cometary materials to be from a hot, high iron flux environment close to the sun. Again, addressing key processes occurring in, in the early solar system. Most recently, working with the Rosetta team, he's established the re relationship between, between cometary water and noble gases and identified U-xenon, a hypothetical component identified by Bob Pepin back in the 1980s, until now undiscovered, the origin of which was unknown. Bernard has shown this to be a cometary, a cometary in origin. The synthesis, as I've said, of these contributions provide an exceptional view on the sources, processes, and evolution of our Earth's mantle and atmosphere. For these and other contributions, Bernard Marti is an extremely worthy recipient of the 2017 Bowen Award. Thank you. You don't need this. No. Okay. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I feel very much blessed and honored to get the Bowen Award uh, from this great petrologist, especially because uh, petrology is not really my field. People in the lab know this. Uh, but uh, I would like to thank uh, all the people and committees who did this possible. I would like to thank Chris also for the very nice word he had, and Bill for managing so well the VGP section. Um, I've been introduced in this, in, in this field of noble gas geochemistry by Professor Minoru Ojima in Tokyo long ago, and in the field of stable isotopes by uh, Marc Jawa in Paris. And I was I have the chance to work with uh, excellent uh, scientists like uh, uh, Francis Albared, Alex Salide, uh, Igor Tolstiki, Yuji Sano, and uh, Mar uh, Marc Chosedon, and so on. And of course, the most important also for me was to work with students and postdoc. And these are just a few of the people in the last 10 years I've been working with. I limited to 10 years because are, in this room there are people, students, former students much before that. Um, Eric Ebra, um, Magali Pujol, uh, David Becker, Maya Kuga, Guillaume Avis, uh, were, were students, were postdocs, like Eric Ebra, Lorette Piani, Michael Brodley, Antonio Caracaosi, and um, technician and uh, engineer in the lab, uh, Laurent Zimmerman and Boucher Tibari. And I would like to have a special dedication to, uh, to uh, my friend and uh, outstanding colleague, Pete Bernard, with whom we built the Noble Gas Lab in, in, in Nancy and unfortunately passed away two years ago. So this talk is uh, dedicated to his memory. I've been working also with uh, fantastic scientists in different fields, the so-called the Arkham guys, Pascal Filippo, Axel Hoffman, Nick Hunt, who have been uh, to the field to collect some samples of the ancient atmosphere. Um, we analyzed them in the lab with Chris, with Ray Burgess doing argon argon dating. Um, I was part also of a fantastic uh, mission called uh, Genesis. Uh, the PI was Don Burnett, and uh, thanks to this, we were given access to analyze the nitrogen isotope composition of the sun, which is a key of understanding the origin of volatile elements. And we did it with Mark Chosino and the ion probe. And uh, recently, I was also involved in the Rosetta mission, uh, led by Kat in, in an instrument led by Katrin Dardweg, and we got some uh, interesting data from, from a comet. Okay, so uh, I put this, this figure is, uh, is, is a drawing by uh, Anastasius Kircher. He was a Jesuit monk who visited southern Italy, and uh, he was very much impressed by the volcano, so he tried to figure out what is happening be between uh, below our feet. So he, he rightly uh, thought that there was internal fire. There was some uh, reservoirs of water that were heated by the fire going up. Uh, going to the surface, but you also inferred that there was some water coming from the sky. And what I'm going to say is, most, uh, is mostly this. I will try just to put some numbers on this process. So my talk will be about the origin uh, of uh, volatile element on Earth with special emphasis to, to water. So to, start, to start with, there is a scheme showing uh, the uh, protostars, uh, the sun, surrounded by uh, a, a disk of gas and dust. And um, th this matter co coalesced to give uh, planetesimals. 
then uh, embryos and planets, the gas dissipated and gave the architecture of the present day solar system as we know it, with the internal parts, which was probably too, too energetic at that time to really uh, be able to accumulate volatile elements. There was a kind of frost line beyond which water and other elements were, were just uh, ice and uh, closer to the sun, the solids could not re really retain volatile except in organics. And so that um, the common wisdom is for the moment at least that uh, the earth grew up first dry but uh, gradually accumulated some, uh, some bodies that were more volatile rich like uh, asteroids. Uh, we have some, uh, some, some of, the, of the meteorites are known to be um, carbon and water rich, not liquid water but uh, hydrated minerals. And another potential source of course are comets which are made of half, about half of ice of water and other ices. And all these bodies, uh, probably in the beginning of the solar system, just crossed the orbits of the inner planets. Okay, so just to sum up, the potential sources of uh, volatile elements on Earth are the solar nebula. When the Earth grew up, there was still some gas, and we have evidence from neon isotopes that some of this gas was trapped there. The asteroids I mentioned, and the comets. Okay, so to start with, uh, the nitrogen isotopes. Uh, there are two stable isotopes for nitrogen that gave very interesting uh, information about uh, the origin of, uh, of the planets. So in this diagram here, the astronomers use 14N over 15N. The cosmochemists use the delta notation. To make it simple, when you go up, this means that you are nitrogen rich. And um, there was a kind of messy dispersion of data in the inner solar system, you have the planets and the meteorites that uh, were more or less the same at this scale of variation at least, with some outliers contained in organics, meteoritic organics. But the outer solar system, was, uh, there was a dichotomy between uh, uh, comets and giant planets, the giant planet be being depleted in nitrogen-15 and comet being rich. And it turned out that we didn't know at the time what was the composition of the protosolar nebula, the starting composition. So what was the origin of this variation? And uh, thanks to uh, Don Burnett at Caltech, he designed a fantastic mission that consisted in, a tra in a collecting solar wind ions for three years, enough to analyze the isotope composition. So the, the, there were major objectives. One was oxygen isotope that was uh, analyzed by Kevin McKeegan in UCLA. And the other one was nitrogen isotopes that we did uh, in Nancy. And the bottom line is that the solar wind is there. It represents the sun, and the sun represents the solar nebula because all the material now, most of the material that was present is in the sun. So it became quite clear that starting with the solar nebula that were nitrogen poor, there existed some process that enriched nitrogen 15 in all the uh, bodies of the solar system except the giant planets that have trapped the nebula gas. There is a kind of uh, similar uh, logics for the d over h ratio, deuterium over hydrogen, with a protosolar nebula that is deuterium poor. This was um, estimated from the analysis of uh, the Jupiter atmosphere plus that of the sun. You have the Earth and meteorites that seems to share a common range of values, and the comets are deuterium rich. So if you put together all this, uh, this data, you end up with possibly three main reservoirs appearing in the solar system. The protosolar nebula that was here, the Earth, Moon, and, and me bulk meteorites being here, so this would define the inner solar system, and then the outer solar system being rich in nitrogen-15 and deuterium. And whatever the cause, a, there is a lot of work ongoing to try to understand what is the cause of this variation, but whatever the cause, it can be used as a guideline to understand uh, any genetic relationship between planets and, and these reservoirs. And it turns out, it turns out that the, chondri the chondrite, the meteorite, primitive meteorite, and the inner planet seems to share or to have uh, a genetic link whereas you cannot do this volatile element with either the protosolar nebula or the comets. The next step now is, uh, is about noble gas, and uh, most of my talk will be about uh, these uh, exceptional traces. Uh, the noble gas forms the last uh, column of the periodic table because they, they don't have any chemistry because they are 
uh, electronic layers are saturated, and they can be considered as physical traces. And we particularly are interested in the xenonisotopes, uh, uh, which is the heaviest stable noble gas. One reason being the richness of its isotopic composition. You have nine isotopes from 124 to 136 that were produced by different nuclear processes. So as everything in the solar system, we are stardust. And there was a kind of homogenization that defined the composition of the solar system early or before formation of the solar system. Also, you have some isotopes that are produced by extinct radioactivity. One is uh, the decay of 129 iodine giving, ray, uh, giving uh, 129 xenon with a half-life of 16 million years. And there is also some fission from plutonium that I will talk about. OK, so now we can normalize uh, this isotope composition to one given isotope. It's a normalization diagram, in that case, 130 xenon. And we normalize to the solar wind, which is the best representative we have for the nebular composition. And it turns out that atmospheric xenon is absolutely different from solar. It would be different from chondritic, also for meteoritic at this scale. It, it, it would be very close to solar. And it's different because it's very much enriched in the heavy isotopes and depleted in the light one, in a way that seems to, to, uh, to mimic a mass-dependent fractionation. But the trick is that it's a very huge. It's 4% per atomic mass unit. It's huge for heavy element like xenon. And krypton and argon are very little fractionated. So this has been known for very long, and it was called one of the xenon paradox. And we've been thinking about what is the cause of this fractionation for long. And to understand this, we went to, uh, to the Archean terrain. We wanted to analyze all xenon, paleoatmospheric xenon, and paleoatmospheric gases trapped in Archean sediments. Like this, this is a North Pole. So we have been to North Pole, uh, Northwest Australia. We have been to Barberton in, in uh, South uh, Africa. And we have been collecting uh, quartz, hydrothermal quartz, as well as barite. And in these samples, you have minute bubbles of uh, fluid inclusion, in fact, of fluids that were once in contact with the atmosphere and that has been kept uh, uh, because this terrain were not metamorphed so much. So the idea was to, uh, to, to see if we could find a composition similar to modern xenon or if there was an evolution through time. And just to show you now, I have to change a little bit the normalization. So now we are going to normalize it to, uh, to uh, atmospheric xenon, OK? And doing so, we obtain this composition. So now it's again normalized, so this time to air and to 130. And of course, by uh, mass balance, the solar wind now appears depleted in the heavy isotopes. So what we have been doing with the students, with Magali Pujol and uh, Guillaume Avis, we have been analyzing xenon trapped in this old fluid inclusion. And it appears that what we obtain is a composition that is intermediate between what we believe is uh, the starting composition, somewhere here, like uh, solar wind xenon. We see it's not exactly solar wind, but for the moment here, going to the present day atmosphere that is flat. So you can think about this slope getting flat with time. And this is an, another example uh, from, uh, from Guillaume Avis' thesis. Uh, here, this line, the almost vertical line at this scale, is a solar xenon. The horizontal line is uh, atmospheric xenon. And so what we obtain is something that is intermediate between initial xenon and modern xenon. In addition, thanks to the, uh, the progress made in the analysis of uh, xenon isotopes, uh, Guillaume could show that, in fact, you have a deficit in 129 xenon at that time. And 129 xenon is coming from the, partly from the gassing of the Earth. This really is a smoking gun to, to say this, this gas is very ancient. It, uh, this was the atmosphere when the gassing of 129 xenon from the mantle was not complete as it is now. So uh, by analyzing several samples, we obtain a kind of uh, evolution curve. Now this curve shows you the slope of this line with time. So we are going this way. We are going, 
and the curves seems to the, the, sorry the the um, Isotope fractionation uh, seems to, to increase with time, starting from a composition here and going to a composition comparable to the modern, uh, comp uh, modern atmosphere. And it's important to note that krypton is not fractionated in this ancient air. So it's really something that is specific to xenon. Krypton, argon are not fractionated, or a little bit, but not so much. So this means that this process is probably xenon specific. And the only way you can really think about xenon being different from other noble gas by its ionization potential, which is lower than, than of the ozonable gas. It's even lower than that of CO2, CO, and N2. So we think that there is a kind of uh, process linked to ionization, and linked to ionization and escape to space. Once ionized, then it find its way to escape and to fractionate its isotopes. And uh, in line with this, the flux of uh, solar UV in the past was in the UV range, far UV range, below 100 uh, nanometers, was about one order of magnitude higher than today. This means that ionization was probably more effective. Of course, once it's ionized, you can find a way, or we have to find a way, to escape xenon by this, by this process. That's where we are for the moment, and uh, some people are working on this. Kevin uh, Zan is very active in trying to find also a solution for escaping xenon. Okay. No, the thing is that we, we think we find a way to fractionate xenon isotopes through geological history. So we can correct for this fractionation. And if we correct, we do that. Now we correct for um, mass, mass dependent fractionation of 4.2% per atomic mass unit. We obtain this. So this is uh, atmospheric xenon corrected for mass fractionation. Then uh, we can remove the 129 excess because it's a, it's a radioactivity. And so we obtain some things that resemble very much to solar wind xenon for all isotopes except for 134 and 136. So you cannot relate directly atmospheric xenon to, um, to a solar wind xenon by mass fractionation. You need something else. S something else. And this is a problem that was um, already found uh, uh, put into evidence by Bob Pepin decades ago. Uh, he called this uh, strange component U xenon, U is for Urs in German, meaning uh, stranger, maybe, or strange. Okay, so the problem of U xenon uh, has been a long standing problem because you don't find this composition in meteorites, you don't find it in other planetary atmosphere. It's really specific to the terrestrial atmosphere. And one way to make this difference is to think about some nucleosynthetic component that differs from uh, the bulk solar wind. And now com comes the comet. And uh, to make it short, the answer is probably in the comets. And uh, there has been a very outstanding mission by the European Space Agency called Rosetta, with the NASA participation, uh, that launched the spacecraft that uh, were close to a comet, comet 67P, Churyumov Gerasimenko, for almost uh, for two years. And during this time, all the gas that were expelled by the ice sublimating into space were analyzed by a mass spectrometer with a high resolution called Rosina under the guidance of Catherine Altweg, and which permitted to analyze the noble gas too. And Catherine became very much persuaded that we needed to have a xenon isotopes to understand an important problem. So she fighted uh, with the other PIs and the navigation people to have uh, the Rosina spacecraft close to the comet for three weeks. And it was, uh, uh, it was less than 10 kilometers. It's very close. The comet is four kilometers. And the engineers, the flight engineers, were very much concerned because uh, the spacecraft used a, kind, uh, a so called star tracking system. It's, it's looking at uh, fixed stars to make the navigation. And the dust expelled by the comets could make some trouble with the navigation. And in fact, during 24 hours, they almost lost control of the spacecraft. So anyway, after three weeks, we got some data. And this is how uh, xenon from the comet looks like. 120, the light, very light isotope could not be analyzed. Not, they are very rare, uh, not enough signal. And it's worth to note that on board, there was some reference gas. There was a standard. When you do mass spectrometry, you need standards. And there was some xenon gas, terrestrial xenon, of course, on board, which gave the, this uh, diamond um, 
shaped uh, green uh, symbols, and uh, which are very close to air. Air is here the dotted blue line here. Okay. So this since there was no problem, no big problem with the analyzer, and the composition that was analyzed uh, uh, by the by the instrument was very very different from solar or from anything that you you might know. It was different because there is a kind of excess in 139 xenon. And there is a huge depletion in, one, in 34 and 136, exactly what you need to make your xenon. And so we thought that we, we, might, uh, we, we, we got a solution for the xenon problem by thinking first that the comet has accumulated some xenon components coming from a nuclear synthetic mix different from the solar system with less air processor type uh, isotopes, but it's a huge difference. So one possible implication would be that this ice, or at least part of the cometary ice, is interstellar, is not solar system. This is another story. But for what we wanted to do, we started to make some very simple game by mixing uh, solar or chondritic, in this case we, we took chondritic xenon, with cometary xenon until we could fit uh, uh, xenon, And it's, it fits pretty well. xenon is the, the red dot here. The mix between cometary xenon and, in that case, the chondritic xenon are the, the blue uh, dots, and it fits very well the deficit you expect for your xenon. So we think that we have now a possible, uh, possible evidence that the comet left a fingerprint, a kind of DNA uh, signature, into the atmosphere of the Earth. And you need about 22% cometary xenon to make, uh, to make the job, so it fits pretty well. Which would mean that the atmosphere, you are, you are uh, breathing uh, cometary xenon just right now with a proportion of about 20% uh, uh, cometary to 80% uh, chondritic xenon. So the, the next question is that now we have an evidence that at least one comet could have uh, bring some noble gas to the terrestrial atmosphere. And the next question is uh, does it matter for water? So again, we can. Get, do a kind of a mixing game by drawing mixing curves. We know what is the uh, xenon to water ratio in the comet. It has been measured. We can compute what is the ratio of xenon to, to the ocean in, in, on Earth. And if you put 20% cometary xenon uh, uh, to Earth, you would add not so much water. In fact, there are two mixing curves because we don't know how much xenon has been escaping. So this is present-day xenon, and this is about 20 times more xenon at the time. There are some numbers in the literature. But the bottom line is that you would add less than one per mil per, uh, water up to a few percent cometary water to the ocean. So you would not impact so much the budget for water, which is consistent with the fact that the dear virtue ratio looks more like uh, asteroidal or chondritic than cometary. But there's other implication for that. And one implication is that you could add a lot of organics. And um, this is again a budget of carbon, where uh, this is the number of moles of carbon at the surface of the Earth. This is a biosphere. Here's the total surface carbon as carbonates. And this is how much organics, how much carbon as organics you would add by adding just a, 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 little, bit, uh, a little bit of comet. And it, it seems to be quite significant. I'm not saying that uh, life uh, comes from comets. I'm just saying that uh, from mass balance uh, consideration, you could add significant amount of organics, depending, of course, how the organics could survive uh, the delivery to, to the Earth. And I think there are also implications for, uh, for the formation of the solar system, of the, so the dynamics of the solar system. Uh, people modeling this uh, type of uh, formation believes that once Jupiter was formed, it acted like a barrier for preventing bodies from the outer solar system going to the inner solar system. So this kind of results interest very much uh, uh, modelers of solar system formation. And, okay, now we have, uh, we have some evidence that we have cometary xenon at this Earth surface. But the next question is how much, um, what is the composition of xenon in the deep Earth? And to, to tackle this problem, we have been analyzing uh, some CO2-rich gas in the volcanic province of Eiffel in Germany. This is a recent volcanic pro uh, province from Eocene to present. 
in which you have um, uh, very recent volcanoes, but also a lot of uh, CO2 rich spring. And we have been focused on uh, one spring uh, for which we have evidence that the contamination by atmospheric gas was quite low from other noble gas. Um, so we call it the Eiffel Tower. That's where we have been collecting. And in fact, it's very easy to, to collect. That's uh, the, the gang from Nancy collecting the gas. And just a small yeah, movie showing that <laughs> we bring some bottle, uh, stainless steel pre evacuated bottle, and we, 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 we just go to this uh, CO2 rich spring that you will see here. And so you have this bubble, and we collect this bubble by circulation into bottle. And then we do some high precision analysis. Okay of this gas, and it turned out that this gas is not atmospheric. It's different from the atmosphere. It's enriched in the light isotopes. Because we have a lot of gas, we could get a precision allowing us to analyze all the isotopes, including the light ones, which are in very small abundance. We could reach a permit precision. For many people in the room, this is just uh, bullshit. I mean, uh, the permit precision, uh, you can do it. Uh, you can go to the per 10,000 or so. But for noble gas, it's pretty difficult. And you need a lot of gas to do so, because you don't have a lot of gas. So you have uh, this composition that is different from, uh, from the terrestrial, from the atmospheric one. From the stable isotopes, it seems to be fractionated. In fact, it seems to be intermediate, again, between what you would expect as prime modal xenon and modal atmosphere. And also, you have some excess of 129 uh, xenon that is from the decay of 129 iodine with half-life for 16 million years. And you have also some excess of uh, EV xenon isotopes that are due to the, fish, to the fission of plutonium-244, an extinct radioactivity that was present when the solar system formed, with a half-life of 82 million years. So we have both the stable isotope system and we have the uh, um, extinct radioactivity system. And here, just for comparison, what we've been doing, we have the um, Eiffel gas is a blue one, and uh, the green diamonds are a mixing between chondritic and atmospheric xenon in a proportion that you will see uh, later on is 84% atmospheric and the rest being chondritic. We think about chondritic and not solar just because thanks to the precision we get, we could again do some mixing exercise here in this diagram. We have a mixing between atmospheric xenon here and some end member components. The Eiffel is here. These are data obtained by the Manchester Oxford group on CO2 well gas from the US. And they all felt very well a mixing curve between meteoritic and not U and not solar wind. So this means that what we have in, uh, in this gas is a lot of air contamination, of course. Uh, it's always a problem when you collect gases because there is air everywhere and it's very rich in noble gas. But the end member is, seems to be chondritic, that is meteoritic, asteroidal, if you, and not you or solar wind. And also it's interesting that all the data fits quite well, the same mixing line, whatever FL, which seems to be a mental plume, I shall come back to that, or the CO2 well gas, which are believed to come from the, from the convective mantle. So because we have extinct radioactivities, we could also play with the fact that we can compute a, a kind of a closure uh, age, that's what people do with extinct radioactivities, by combining them. And we came to the conclusion that the reservoir that is hosting this gas now has been uh, closed within something like 100 million years after start of solar system formation. So what we are now uh, uh, looking for are very ancient gas that was trapped very early in the Earth's history and that probably didn't mix up so much with uh, uh, with gas from either the atmosphere or from the mantle. And we can go also a little bit further, always again playing with uh, extinct radioactivity. Uh, in this diagram, the y-axis represents the amount of plutonium you have divided by the total amount of xenon produced by fission, because fission of uranium also produces xenon isotopes. So this is the ratio between plutonium produced xenon and plutonium plus uranium xenon uh, produced. This means that when the Earth formed, you have much more plutonium xenon than uranium xenon. The factor was about 30. 
This means that in a closed system, this ratio should be equal to 1. So the closed system would give a composition that is here. And once you degas the manses through time, you lose plutonium xenon and you accumulate uranium xenon. So this is clearly an indicator or a kind of a tracer of um, degassing of the mantle. And it's interesting that the FL gas plots very close to Iceland gas. This is a work done by Sujoy Mukopadai's group and Rita Parai. They did a fantastic job by analyzing glasses, uh, high, pre high precision analysis of xenon in, a, in a subglacial glass, as they obtained some data that also seems to indicate a closed system. And Iceland is obviously a mantle plume. There is another mantle plume here. So it seems that all these data are not so many, but they seem to define a model, uh, an area, which would characterize plume, uh, mantle plumes. In contrast, data come that come from a few more glass, gas rich more glass, and from CO2 well gas from the US define another area that is different, that is probably characterizing the convective mantle. So we ended with two uh, areas. One is a plume-like that is very little degassed, that is very close to closed system condition, and a more uh, area that has been degassing xenon through time, in which case xenon from uranium become more abundant than xenon left from plutonium at the beginning. There are many interesting things in this, in this diagram also. The, the, the x-axis gives you the ratio between iodine and plutonium, Iodine is volatile, plutonium is not, it's a refractory. That means that this ratio, it seems that the, because we are looking at extinct radioactivity, we are looking at what's happened at the beginning, and it seems that this area, the convective mantle, was more iodine, volatile rich, than the deep mantle. So this is more controversial and very uh, subject to discussion, but also what maybe we are looking at is the growth, it's the growth of the Earth starting from pretty dry material and be, be, uh, becoming wet with time. But the important thing is that what we, are, what we have here is a deep reservoir that is very little degassed and that was probably closed within the, or at least that uh, the closure time of this reservoir was very early, 100 million years after the start of solar system formation. And from that, of course, we can go a little bit further. We can try to compute how much major volatile we would have in this reservoir. Uh, the reasoning is quite simple. Plutonium is like uranium, it's refractory. There are numbers for the bulk silicators content of the uranium, something like 20 ppb. The plutonium to uranium ratio is known for meteorites. So you can infer how much plutonium was present as a refractory element when uh, this uh, mantle domain was formed. You can also compute how much xenon was produced then. And then, if you want to push a little bit more, we know that in the Eiffel gas, we have 2.6% com uh, uh, xenon coming from plutonium. We can correct for atmospheric contamination. And if we assume that CO2 and xenon did not fractionate si since the mantle source, which I admit is quite a big assumption, but that you end up, you can compute how much CO2 was present in, the, in, the, in this deep mantle source, and you end up with something like several hundred ppm carbon, which is one order of magnitude much higher than what you would find in the upper mantle, sampled by MOBS. It's just, the reasoning is just, plutonium is refractory, we, we can have a quite firm estimate how much plutonium was there, how much um, 136 xenon was produced, and then, we scale CO2 to, to, uh, to, uh, to physiogenic xenon from plutonium. The bottom line is that it fully confirms what you can get from, uh, uh, from helium isotopes, that you need a mantle source that is rich in volatile, and that probably never really degas since long, or at least we don't have evidence for degassing. Okay, and another interesting thing is about this uh, <coughs> 100 million years uh, delay after start of solar system formation, which means from now 4.45 or so billion years ago. And interestingly, the systematics of the uh, samarium neodym, neodym isotopes using extinct and extant radioactivity also suggests strongly that you have an event 
that took place, a major differentiation event that took place around 4.4 billion years ago. And uh, it's even more precise, 4.4 plus or minus 0 0.1 billion years ago. And this was probably a major event, possibly or probably related to, uh, to, a magma, to ocean magma episodes. So um, now I would like just to, 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 to make the point uh, or we, we, we see the things happening. So we start from the solar system formation here at zero, the first solid form. It's not to scale. There is a nebular gas epoch where uh, embryos are growing up. There is still the gas from the nebula. Some, I didn't mention neon, but some neon gas from the nebula might have dissolved at that time. So we have a fingerprint of, 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 uh, of uh, Jupiter or small Jupiter-like atmosphere at the time. There are other views for this, but this is a, a possibility. The gas dissipates, and then we are growing up uh, the years. And we have to accrete bodies that contain already volatiles, because uh, if we do a mass balance, you need more than what the late veneer could have brought. You need something like 2% equivalent uh, chondritic material, carbonaceous chondritic material. So you have the, the Earth growing up with uh, wet bodies coming. You have, of course, the lunar impacts that probably impacted a lot, uh, something happening. And then we have the closure of the mantle indicated by xenon. And then you have also this magma ocean crystallization uh, indicated by samarium neodym uh, 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 differentiation. So there may have been one. This might be only one event. Or it could be several events, uh, several uh, big uh, impact events that could have occurred around this time. I think this is a, an area of research that needs to be investigated uh, uh, deeply. And finally, you add the comets after everything is, is finished here. Why? Because you don't mix up cometary xenon with chondritic xenon within the Earth. So the best way to do so is to add the cometary uh, reef uh, after the Earth is already formed and stabilized. And uh, so this would be something between 4.4 billion years ago. And here, Guillaume Avis in his work have shown that at 3.5 billion years ago, there was already huge xenon. So this is about the time lag we can add uh, the comets. So I think uh, we are more or less uh, end up uh, with, uh, with this travel. So coming back to the, the picture by uh, Ast Athanasius uh, uh, Kircher, we have this uh, accretion of uh, wet bodies taking place. We have the late uh, late accretion at the surface from uh, impacted bodies. And these are the conclusion. The major volatiles, hydrogen, nitrogen, are, seems to come mainly from the inner solar system reservoirs. Uh, chondritic volatiles were trapped during Earth's building stage. They are not a late veneer. This is for mass balance. And also there are some independent evidence that uh, you cannot do a late veneer with uh, chondritic uh, material. Uh, xenon isotopes are consistent with a deep mantle that was volatile rich that closed within the first 100 million years after start of solar system formation and was mainly isolated from uh, meant large scale meant convection this time because it didn't degas really, contrary to what you see now in uh, MORB uh, type uh, gases. The xenon isotope fingerprints a cometary contribution. The oceanic water is mainly non cometary it's would call asteroidal rather, but some of the prebiotic material could have been delivered by comets. And finally, the cometary contribution were probably late with respect to the main building stage of the Earth and took place after the Earth was already formed and stabilized and could be related with uh, whatever uh, could have happened like uh, the late TV bombardment and so on. And I will finish here. Thank you for your attention. I would like to receive questions. Mark first, and, and if you could use the speaker, uh, the microphone. Okay. Congratulations. Thank you. Say the question. 
Well, um, one possibility. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, the question is: uh, Can you comment about the fractionation of the iodine uh, plutonium or iodine xenon? Iodine plutonium in the Mohr reservoir. Well, I, I think one possibility is that what we are looking at is uh, fingerprints of the accretion of, uh, of uh, the Earth with volatile becoming richer when the Earth grow up, with some deep mantle reservoir being preserved, being uh, volatile poor. That's a possibility. But maybe, yeah, well, as indicated by other isotope system like uh, silver or whatever, you, or chromium, you, you start volatile pool and then you... Bill White? Yeah, yeah. Well, um, that's a very important point. Uh, Bill is saying that uh, what about uh, the uh, apparent excess of 129 xenon in the cometary xenon? And uh, this, indeed, is a very interesting problem uh, that would suggest that, uh, in the atmosphere at least, 129 excess is inherited. It is not from mantle degassing. So basically, uh, the paradigm up to now was that uh, the excess of 129 xenon in the atmosphere, which is about 6 or 7 percent, uh, resulted from early degassing of the Earth. And, that was, uh, and it was used to date the atmosphere, giving an age of uh, 100 million years or so, or if you correct for loss, 40 million years. But yes, at least there is a, now a strong possibility that this is inherited, which means that you have to completely think about, again, the xenon systematic of the atmosphere. Just let me point that uh, this doesn't affect the mantle, because we don't see evidence for cometary xenon in the mantle. So I think using uh, uh, xenon, 129 xenon excess for for the mantle is still valid, is not impacted by it. All right, thank you very much. Please welcome again. Again, without question, another great pleasure. So please let me introduce you to Craig Manning, the 2017 Norman L. Bowen Awardee. Craig is recognized for outstanding contributions to volcanology, geochemistry, or petrology. Great work, Craig. His citationist, please, will be Peter Kellerman. At a time when many of us focus on models of multidimensional chemical systems, pursue the first measurements of new isotope systematics, analyze ever smaller samples, or write short silver bullet papers. Craig Manning brings exceptional rigor and simplicity to experimental geochemistry. As a result, his experimental results are timeless benchmarks for future work. The same results are timely contributions to understanding complex topics, such as the evolution of aqueous fluids in subduction zones and speciation in fluids at high pressure. This is a unique combination. In his dedication to a simple physical chemistry approach, Craig stands almost alone among his generation of experimental petrologists. His insight into design of single-phase solubility experiments and their application to multi-phase, multi-component systems is unmatched. Craig's work calls to mind the giants of experimental geochemistry, 
Norman Bowen, who merged observational geology with the rigor of chemical thermodynamics. George Kennedy, whose experiments brought similar discipline to hydrothermal systems. Hal Helgeson, who, like Bowen, brought physical chemistry to bear on the study of water-rock reaction. And Bruce Watson, whose innovative experiments showed a generation how min mineral solubility data could be applied to real geologic problems. Craig is a sought-after and conscientious advisor with many papers first authored by his students. He's an experienced field geologist who spent many seasons in Greenland and the Himalaya. Craig has published more than 95 papers during this century, so one might expect him to be something of a nerd. Yet this is far from the truth. Craig's wife, Becky, is an accomplished filmmaker, producer, and professor at UCLA, and he spends much more time socializing with Becky's interesting colleagues than with boring geoscientists such as those of us here in this room. He's a great reader, a generous friend, and a sophisticated traveler. Craig brings honor, credibility, and style to the Bowen Award, the AGU, and geoscience in general. So to this formal citation, I'd like to add a few personal remarks. At our age, it becomes tempting to delegate or drop the incremental process of field observation and focus on the big picture, writing authoritative review papers, and the very small picture via thin sections, SEM, TEM, synchrotron, and so on. Moreover, after holding many leadership roles, chair of a big department at UCLA, chair of the executive committee of the Deep Carbon Observatory, to name a few examples, one might expect Craig to view the tedious process of describing drill core from 30,000 feet. After all, how often does this prosaic process shake the universe or even shake the American Geophysical Union? And yet Craig continues, and in addition, Craig continues to run a very productive experimental lab, lab which is time consuming in itself. Thus, I was happily surprised to learn that Craig is still willing to return to our geological roots. To my immense gratitude, Craig chose to join us on the drill site of the Oman Drilling Project, serving as site scientist for several weeks last spring. Even more strikingly, Craig rescheduled a DCO executive committee meeting in order to spend a month on board the drilling vessel Chikyu in port in Japan in the intensely incremental process of describing the drill core from Oman. So okay, Craig, now I'm really impressed. Thanks. If anybody wants to hear about the truly incremental nature of that work, you can come to my talk later on today. <laughs> uh, thanks, Peter. Thanks, Bill. Uh, Peter, I think that your list of eclectic uh, kind of grouping of uh, the e experimental geochemists and theoretical geochemists is probably the first time that Bowen, Helgeson, Kennedy, and Watson have been mentioned in the same sentence. Uh, but it does sort of emphasize the somewhat tortuous path, like this quartz vein here, that I took to get to experimental petrology. Um, <clears throat> it started sort of with an epiphany at Yellowstone that hot springs were pretty cool. And uh, after traveling as an undergraduate, I went back to uh, the University of Vermont where I was as an undergrad and started taking geology classes which led eventually to igneous and metamorphic petrology where a, my teacher Barry Doolin uh, decided that it was important for us to learn the classics and our igneous petrology textbook was in fact the evolution of the igneous rocks and that's the one right there. Um, and so this you know, I was struck by the phase diagrams. I thought this was the coolest thing I'd ever seen, but it didn't make me an experimental petrologist at first. I had to go through uh, several steps, uh, uh, going to Stanford University, working with Bob Coleman on ophiolites, then with Dennis Bird, where we really tore apart the uh, fossil hydrothermal systems of East Greenland and had a huge amount of fun doing that. Of course, if you're interested in aqueous geochemistry and petrology at the same time and you're in California, you are, can't help but be struck by the vein systems that are prominent in the Franciscan formation. And so I was raring to go to study that process of fluid rock interaction and subduction zones, uh, only to find out that the wonderful 
uh, construct of the Helgus and Kirkham Flowers equation of state for electrolytes, which one would use to do this, was only good to five kilobars and so inaccessible essentially for subduction zones. And this always bothered me. So starting as a postdoc, I convinced Steve Bolin to take me on and let me in the late hours of the night work on trying to figure out a way to uh, measure mineral solubility at high pressure to provide some of the first experimental data that would allow us to do this. And uh, it didn't work for a long time, but eventually it did. And uh, once I got down to UCLA, I repurposed our hydrothermal system, our, our piston cylinders to become hydrothermal apparatus, basically. And uh, that led us to all sorts of uh, experiments on high pressure fluids, which I want to talk about today. This work is absolutely a collaborative effort, and it depends on uh, the contributions of a huge number of people. You can see recent uh, students and postdocs and visitors to the lab, but I particularly want to mention right now a colleague that has joined this effort and contributed massively to uh, the work that we've done, and that's Bob Newton. He's been a constant companion, really good friend, and uh, he's helped mentor all of the people that you see here, and without this uh, his efforts and his enthusiasm and expertise, none of this would really honestly be possible. So back to the uh, Bowen and his book. Of course, Wayne Burnham famously pointed out in the 50th year anniversary of evolution of the igneous rocks, and this is too small for most of you to read, I'm sure, but he pointed out that uh, Bowen was essentially somewhat skeptical of the effects of fluids, uh, in his case, on uh, magma generation. And uh, he knew that it was, that, that there were, was, say, water dissolved in magmas, but it was not something that necessarily affected the uh, solidus as much as we now know it did. And um, so it's somewhat ironic that I share today's Bowen Award with Bernard, uh, two of us uh, deeply engaged for all our careers in the study of the very materials that Bowen was so skeptical about, uh, but uh, I think that uh, much of what we've learned would, uh, uh, would fit wonderfully into his, uh, his framework today. So what I want to talk about today is, in fact, what we have learned in this sort of quest to better understand deep fluids. And, you know, the question would be, why would you want to do this? And, uh, of course, we understand a great deal about aqueous chemistry and the fluids that we're familiar with at the Earth's surface, uh, for example, seawater, uh, where we can see that most of the solutes dissolved in the seawater as ions are pr present as ions that are solvated by water molecules and held apart from, finding, from forming ion pairs in seawater so that you have, for example, in the lower left of the diagram, magnesium ions and sulfate ions separated from one another by the strong dielectric properties of the solvent H2O. As we go deeper, we have plenty of evidence for fluid rock interaction. We see things like quartz veins and, and many other types of veins as well in the metamorphic rocks that we find close to the brittle ductile transition, say, which is highlighted in purple in the diagram. And here the chemistry starts to change a little bit. Ions are more readily find one another. They form ion pairs more effectively. Uh, Things like aluminum become a little bit soluble, but mostly as, as, as uh, neutral complexes instead of as the ions that are familiar in geothermal systems. Silica solubility all, all obviously has to increase a little bit to form quartz veins and so on. But once we get below the brittle ductile transition, things start to become basically unknown. This is the region in which theory previously has not allowed us to make speculations or extrapolations, and experiments are have historically been extremely difficult. And so what I want to talk about today is the kind of uh, path to better understanding uh, fluids in the area colored purple here. And I'm going to focus chiefly on the lower crust for today, uh, but I'll try to extend that to deeper environments uh, towards the end to bring Bowen back into the picture. We've known that fluids are present throughout the crust during its evolution, its transformation uh, in, in, as heat and mass are moved through it. 
um, and, uh, and as expressed in metamorphic rocks. And uh, one of the prima facie ev bits of evidence for this would, of course, be fluid inclusions, which you can see here. This is a fluid inclusions from a very high-grade metamorphic rock. Um, and so the methods that we've used to try to char characterize these fluids would uh, first and foremost be simple experimental petrology done with high pressure apparatus. And in the upper right here you can see our a standard piston cylinder, very much a vintage piston cylinder. Uh, and the thing that is interesting about this particular device, which has long been used to understand mantle melting processes, crystallization at high pressure, uh, and so on, is that it's ideally suited to working on hydrothermal fluids. It, it has a very low thermal mass, you can quench it extremely quickly, and so it's in fact better as an as a apparatus for studying hydrothermal uh, systems than the hydrothermal bomb, which everybody uses at pressures up to about two kilobars. Now, with a piston cylinder, if you can confine the water sufficiently, which was the big challenge, you can uh, study mineral solubility, how much dissolves in water or other fluids, to pressures uh, in excess of, tw of 20 kilobars. Joining the fray in terms of experimental apparatus obviously is the hydrothermal diamond anvil cell which allows you to uh, study the solutions in situ uh, and this gives the capability of doing spectroscopy on the fluid uh, which uh, is a sort of um, complementary form of information that can go along with quantitative uh, solubility measurements. And finally, what's really breathed oxygen into this field in the last uh, few years has been uh, moving beyond the sort of clunky empirical uh, thermodynamic models that uh, I've been using for the last uh, 15 to 20 years uh, and the ex with, with the extension of the Helgus and Kirkham Flowers equation of state approach to high pressures uh, by Dmitry Sverzinski and, and team in the form of the deep earth water model. And this has all brought together uh, uh, basically and revitalized this field in a way that is uh, proving to be quite exciting as more and more people are getting involved. And indeed, independent of the petrology work and the geochemistry work that we're doing, the, in the geophysical uh, community there's a very great deal of excitement as well about uh, remote sensing types of techniques, especially with electromagnetic data. They're showing that there is abundant evidence for fluids in the lower crust uh, today in various convergent margin settings. So here's an example, uh, and this comes from a review paper here by Palmy and Evans, but the, the key observation is from Warzuski et al. in 2011, and what you can see here is, uh, this is the Cascades, and you can see a conductive region that is uh, vertical here coming off of the slab. It extends all the way into the crust and it is uh, in a very important location with respect to the uh, volcanic front itself. If you uh, notice it's slightly seaward of the actual volcanic front here and this turns out to be true for globally for all convergent margin systems. And so if you uh, plot the uh, if you locate them all on the top of the arc volcano, these would be, then be the trenches for a global series of subduction systems, you can see that there's a conductive anomaly in the lower crust at greater than 15 kilometers or so, most, uh, down to uh, um, as deep as 50 kilometers. And this is roughly 10, 20 to 30 kilometers seaward of the uh, of the volcano, of the volcanic arc front. There's, this is a location where the thermal regime is such that the, uh, the temperatures are too low for melting and the high conductivity can really only be adequately explained by the presence of some sort of fluid phase. Now, what we want to do is figure out what kind of fluid that might be. And so just to conceptualize this, let's think about fluids as uh, lying first and foremost on a, the base of a ternary system like this, water and some dissolved nonpolar gases, CO2 would be the most abundant one, and then some salts like sodium chloride and so on, forming the solvent. That solvent interacts with rock-forming minerals, 
so that the final fluid will be somewhere in this tetrahedron uh, in terms of its composition. For very shallow fluids in geothermal systems and so on, the solubilities of minerals are relatively low, so mostly the fluid is basically on, on the basal plane here. But as pressures and temperatures rise, solubilities of minerals go up. And so the volume that can be occupied, the sort of volume in this tetrahedron that can be occupied by the fluid increases dramatically, both in terms of the solubility of the gases, CO2 is, very, is highly soluble, uh, there's a supercritical fluid at these conditions. Uh, salt uh, also is highly soluble, halite saturation is well past the midway across that salt H2O join in most uh, systems in the lower crust. And so any fluid that's residing within the pore space of a rock will equilibrate with those minerals and therefore lie somewhere on the upper blue plane right here, well into this tetrahedral volume. What I want to do now is just focus first as we go through this on just one side of this, the water mineral uh, join, and we'll start with that and then proceed onward. And so, as I mentioned, uh, uh, we can calculate and predict what the solubilities of materials might be at these conditions now. And so the first panels here show the solubility of a model uh, politic crustal rock, so something that's a luminous sediment. And the minerals that are used to make this model would be muscovite, case bar, potassium feldspar, and quartz. And what you're seeing here is just the relative, is the abundance, quantitative predictions here using the due model of the silica abundance, whether it's as the silica monomer, the silica dimer, uh, other species, potassium, and so on. And you can see changes uh, as temperature rises with increasing, uh, at constant pressure, and as pressure rises at constant temperature. These are sort of lower crustal types of conditions here. The total amounts of stuff dissolved in the solution are shown in, in this central set of panels here. And you can see that the, uh, the sum of silica, silicon, potassium, and aluminum increases so that we have the total dissolved solids, or TDS, along the dashed lines, both rising with pressure and with temperature. And finally, the pH of this fluid is shown at the bottom here, and I'll return to this in a moment. There are three conclusions that we can immediately draw from these kinds of calculations. The first is that the most abundant solute in solution is silica in the lower crust and middle crust. Okay? Silica is your dominant constituent in, in water. This is different than what you see in geothermal systems. Silica is a major constituent of metamorphic fluids and fluids that are being uh, liberated during degassing of, say, plutons in the lower crust and middle crust. Of course, the Earth has been trying to tell us this for a long time. This is what this, these quartz veins have long, uh, you know, been no noted by people studying metamorphic rocks. And uh, of course, it's simply a consequence of fluids moving along a pressure tr temperature gradient in the veins and the solubility decreases and out comes the quartz. And the reason can be seen if you look at a simple plot showing the concentration of silica either as log molality for those aqueous geochemists on the left or as weight percent, if that's a, a, a concentration scale you prefer on the right. Uh, and you can see that as pressure increases at any temperature, the solubility of quartz increases isothermally along each of those lines. Notice that the major, the, the largest increase happens at lowest pressure. So the reason that these deep fluids are different is simply that there's a very large pressure gradient uh, where the solubility increases radically in the two to four kilobar range, so that by the time you get down into the middle crust, you have much, much higher solubilities of quartz than you do in shallow systems. Another interesting observation is that the fluid, as long as we just restrict ourselves to water, um, the fluid that's equilibrated with the rock will have an alkaline pH, okay? And that's shown in these lower panels here, where you can see neutral pH shown in the black lines, and the red lines are the, are, is the pH for this equilibrated mineral assemblage of potassium, feldspar, muscovite, and quartz. So let's just stop and think about this alkalinity thing here. We're all familiar with neutral pH at ambient conditions being 7. But as pressure and temperature increase, of course, the equilibrium constant for water dissociation, which defines neutral pH, changes significantly as well. So down in the lower crust and upper mantle, neutral pH is a very different number. In fact, it's much lower because the extent of dissociation of water is higher. 
And so at these conditions then, the uh, neutral pH, because the extent of dissociation is higher, the neutral pH will be lower. And what you can see here is neutral pH plotted on the y-axis, and you can see uh, temperature on the bottom axis, and you can see uh, two kilobars, five kilobars, 10 kilobars showing sort of isobars, changes in, neutr in, in neutral pH, and then uh, se several linear geotherms. Regardless of the conditions uh, that you choose, the neutral pH is not seven. It's values that range from about five and a half down to values as low as three and a half. This is um, the, the conclusion that I drew was based on a simple mineral assemblage. If you take rocks of average composition, say an average crustal pelite with 10 components, an average morb-like basalt or an ultramafic rock, and you do the full problem of equilibrating a fluid with each of these types of bulk compositions, solve for all the stable minerals at any given point with the, stand, the, the classic pseudosection approach, and then equilibrate a H2O with those minerals at every point, what you get is, uh, neutral, is alkaline pH everywhere, okay? And so what this, these graphs show is uh, color coding from neutral pH at the bottom, at the bluest colors, all the way up to, in the red colors, three pH units more alkaline than neutral. And you can see that no matter the rock type, basalt, pelite, or ultramafic rock, the uh, pH is always a number greater than neutral. Consequences of this are actually quite interesting because if you think about some mineral that is strongly, that, whose solubility is strongly pH dependent, say calcite, here you can see that uh, the solubility of calcite changes significantly as pH changes. And this is, a cal this is a kind of a diagram you would see in any number of introductory textbooks. Uh, I think that, uh, for example, Bill White's textbook has a nice example of this, uh, this kind of figure. And the thing is, though, this is not done at 25 degrees C1 bar. This is done at set in the lower crust. And the same kind of topology holds. You have solubility lowest at alkaline pHs. And as pH decreases to make to more acidic conditions, the calcite solubility increases, which is why, of course, we put acid on calcite to see if it's there, because it dissolves by degassing uh, CO2 at ambient conditions. Same is true at the lower, in the lower crust. Neutral pH at 700 degrees C, 10 kilobars is right, shown there with a red dot. And if you just dissolve calcite in pure water, it acquires a, a pH that's fixed at the value shown in the open circle. If you can buffer the pH with the various rock assemblages that I uh, previously showed, you would get more, less alkaline conditions. So for example, a K-Feldspar muscovite quartz rock would force the pH to be the value shown there. Uh, which means that the calcite solubility would have to be higher. If you have an ultramafic rock, the pH buffered by that mineral assemblage is actually very close to neutral, still slightly alkaline. And the, notice how big, effect, big an effect that would have on the calcite solubility. The calcite solubility would just go very, very, very high. This is somewhat counterintuitive. Many people associate ultramafic rocks at ambient conditions with uh, very alkaline pHs. Uh, here, they're the acid uh, neutralizing uh, rock type in the lower crust. OK, the final point that we learned from this simple exercise of, of, of looking at fluids, uh, just water and, the, uh, and, and these minerals, would be that the concentrations are relatively dilute. So uh, focus now on the TDS curve, and you can see that the solubility is something like 2 to 5 mole percent. And uh, if we transform this into a, using the ionic strength into a conductivity, we would get conductivities of, of about 10 to about 13 Siemens per meter. That may seem like a large number, but when you account for the fact that this is a fluid in porosity, and that amount of porosity is very small, uh, we can go back to the, the sort of the G anomaly uh, uh, diagram and plot the G anomaly here in the dark green with the conductivities that we need to hit to get to, uh, to, to explain that anomaly that we see uh, using porosities that are realistic 
0.001 is probably almost a maximum. Uh, if you read this literature, you'll see that many uh, in the literature actually use a porosity of 1%, which I think is actually inadvisable. I think it's significantly too high. I think that realistically we should be thinking about porosity as much less. Of course, it's a dynamic phenomenon. But anyway, uh, just pick a number. It will use 0.1%. And a geotherm of about 15 degrees C per kilometer. Then if you want to compare the conductivity of H2O in equilibrium with a model p light assemblage, Along that geotherm, the conductivities predicted are shown in the red line. Much, much too low to explain this uh, anomalously conductive patch of the crust that's in front of the, uh, in front of the arc in conversion margin settings. So that was just water and rock forming minerals. Let's think about the other things that might go along, uh, dissolve into these fluids as well and uh, uh, nonpolar gases like CO2 and salt. So starting with the CO2, uh, well, let's first look at this, this lower panel here, this lower part of the tetrahedron. And now I've kind of colored it in to show that it, it's, uh, there's a very interesting and important aspect of the uh, water CO2 NaCl system that has to be taken into account here. And that is that along H2O CO2 join, there is complete mixing of the two phases at lower crustal conditions. Along the H2O NaCl join, there is mixing out to the point where you reach halite saturation, which is about midway down on the right side of the triangle. But in the middle, the mixing properties are such that, the two, that a fluid unmixes. This is because CO2, H2O has positive departures from ideality along the, uh, that join, and NaCl and uh, H2O have negative departures from ideality on that join. And that leads to a big region of immiscibility in the central part of the diagram here. So to start to think about how this might matter, we can, whether this matters or not, we can go to the fluid inclusion literature. And what we find is that in the fluid inclusion literature, there's a significant uh, number of papers which have identified systems that uh, were metamorphosed at different parts of this uh, ternary space. For example, here's a classic example from uh, Turay in 1971, where he was one of the first discoveries of deep CO2 in, uh, in crustal rocks. Uh, here's an example of uh, some fluids that are in the middle of this diagram. And then uh, a recent example from Newton et al. in 2014 uh, showing uh, co-trapped CO2-rich and NaCl-rich uh, fluids that show that uh, the system was actually uh, being metamorphosed. In this case, it's an Indian granulite uh, uh, in with two fluid phases present at the same time so that the bulk composition of the fluids uh, was in the central part of this diagram in the two fluid region. Focusing on the H2O CO2 join, we can uh, see that CO2 basically kills solubility. As, the, as we add CO2 to H2O, for example, the solubility of quartz will decline significantly as CO2 concentration goes up. And you can see that uh, the, the decrease is relatively dramatic, uh, falling off significantly even at very small, H2, uh, uh, small CO2 concentrations. So what that means is that if we want to extend you know, the left side of this uh, volume here, we just unfold it and we look at what it would look like if we go from that basal plane up to rock forming minerals, very little solubility out in this region in here, and the only place where solubilities are somewhat elevated is when it's pure H2O. CO2 kills solubility and, because it's neutral, uh, drops conductivity down significantly. It's essentially impossible to explain any of the conductivity anomalies we see simply by adding CO2. In fact, the more CO2 you add, the worse the problem gets. Salt, however, does it, is, is somewhat different. Of course, in the, if we look at the solubility of quartz, that solubility also decreases, not quite so much, interestingly, as with CO2, which tells us that there's actually some interaction between the silica in solution and the NaCl. Otherwise, it should lie coincident with the blue line there. But it doesn't. It's elevated slightly above it. And therefore, the, uh, there's some silica NaCl interaction in this, in, the, in this fluid. But other than quartz, other minerals actually show 
and oxide minerals and silicates show increases in solubility with NaCl concentration. So here you can see, plotted in a slightly different way, the change in solubility as you add, X, as you add NaCl relative to what it is in pure water. So the, the value zero here is the, ratio, is the logarithm of the ratio of the value in pure water and whatever we observe experimentally. And you can see that quartz drops off essentially linearly, and this would be a transformation of the previous plot, but a corundum Al203 and wollastonite, a calcium silicate, both show remarkable increases in solubility with NaCl uh, and, and uh, actually significant changes. The change is even more profound when we look at carbonate minerals. And uh, here we can see the solubility of calcite, which we've studied this way, and you can see that it has basically an exp it's a, a X squared dependence on NaCl concentration. Um, and this is, uh, tells us that as the, if we have fluids that are more saline, the ability to transport carbon and CO2 in general will become quite significant. Other carbonate minerals behave differently. There's a, uh, for example, here's magnesite, and you can see that the change, the, the data describe a more of a quadratic sort of uh, a form. And in fact, if you look carefully at our uh, calcite solubility fit, it departs significantly from the fit in the exact same region that, uh, that it, you know, in this low region here, in the low XNACL region, where it seems likely that uh, we've simply adopted an inappropriate functional form there to uh, generate that fit. And the interesting thing is that the, the, the topology of the curve, which we see experimentally in blue, is sort of predicted. It, the, the quality of the fit, it's not great, but the form is similar when we do this theoretically using the do model. There's a strong increase in solubility with a small amount of NaCl, and then, a, and then it tails off as you increase concentration to, of NaCl to higher values, okay? The, it's not, I'm not trying to make the case that the fit here is good. I'm trying to make the case that the functional form that we see experimentally is in fact the same as what, is what we see theoretically. And what we see theoretically is that calcite and magnesite are dissolving in these low NaCl regions as hydrated species, as carbonate, as bicarbonate, and so on. But that must change at high concentrations, which is the only way that you can have the increasing solubility uh, as the sort of ex exponential dependence that we see here. And we actually think we're sensing two fundamentally different regimes in the fluid phase uh, through these kinds of experiments. We're seeing in the region where the curvature is uh, 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 tailing off as NaCl concentration increases. Uh, this is calcite and magnesite dissolving as the familiar ions that we all know and love, bicarbonate and other hydrates. Whereas at higher concentrations, uh, the species that are present in the solution are essentially anhydrous. It's the only way that solubility can increase as water activity decreases with rising NaCl mole fraction. And so in the light blue region, we have a region where standard approaches in aqueous electrolyte geochemistry are relevant and appropriate for describing these fluids. But at the more, in the more concentrated brines, uh, we will need to uh, develop a t set of techniques that are, uh, uh, that are better capable of treating these kinds of solutions. In fact, simple thermodynamic modeling suggests that these are basically like molten salts with a diluent in them, and that diluent is H2O. The diluent is essentially inert. They, the fluids in the darker blue region here behave as molten salts that are simply diluted by uh, H2O with no interaction with that H2O. It's kind of a remarkable and profound chemical process, but all of the data are pointing us in this direction. Okay, so I focused on the other side of this triangle now with adding salt. And we can see that uh, there is a region in the central uh, concentrations, a region in here, where the solubility is higher than, uh, than with CO2, for example. If we go back to our simple calculations, we can at least at low salt concentrations think about what happens as we add chlorine to these solutions. And, uh, and, and let it react with our model assemblage. And you can see that as you add more and more chlorine, 
on the x-axis, the concentrations of aluminum go up uh, and the concentration obviously of chlorine will go up and potassium goes up as well. Silica stays the same and we're not detecting the decline in solubility at, over these low concentration ranges here. And notice that uh, the total dissolved solids go up and finally that the conductivity at the very top of the upper panel also goes up. An interesting aside here is that by adding, uh, uh, by having uh, these uh, salty solutions, the pH is neutralized from the alkaline conditions that I d went on at length about before to something a little more uh, neutral and in fact at very high uh, concentrations of potassium or sodium chloride, these brines may actually be somewhat acidic. Well, in terms of conductivity, this is, uh, of course, uh, obviously going to be important. And you can see that uh, as we increase the concentration of NaCl at 700 degrees C, and we just pick a pressure, whether it's 5 kilobars or 15 kilobars, the uh, conductivity will increase dramatically, even at very low concentrations of NaCl, but continue to do so as we get to very high concentrations of NaCl, as one might expect. These are all calculations that were made possible by our recent excellent paper by uh, Demetrius, uh, Dimitri, uh, uh, Fustikos in uh, 2016. So let's now go back to explaining the gene anomaly with our expanded view of lower crustal fluids. And we can see now that if we uh, have just a very small concentration of chlorine, such as a mole fraction of 0 0.002, which corresponds to half a weight percent of NaCl, or about 0.1 molal, uh, regardless of whether we do this for, the basalt, for a basalt bulk composition, an ultramafic bulk composition, or in the solid line, our favorite p light composition that I've been using throughout this talk, the, con the, the conductivities will still be well below those that are required to explain the G anomaly. But obviously, as we add chlorine, we can get closer to, the, to that dark green box. In fact, if we get there by about 0.05 mole fraction of chlorine, or NaCl or KCl, depending on uh, which system you're working with, um, and we uh, will only increase the conductivity at a porosity of 0 0.001 uh, as we add in more and more chlorine. The only way that the highly conductive regions in these convergent margin settings can be explained is if we're going to use fluids, is with very saline fluids. This is a zeroth order conclusion of this uh, presentation. Some of you may have recognized that parts of the crust along a 15 degree C geotherm will melt at, uh, at, in the deeper parts, we can account for that because we also know how salty fluids affect the generation of granitic magmas. This is something else we've done in our lab and we, I've plotted here in the yellow the, uh, so, the, the fluid saturated solidus for the simple haplogranite system. Here this haplogranite system is equilibrated with a salty fluid changing its salt concentration that increases the melting temperature progressively with rising salt content, and that can be is expressed by the yellow line in this space. Anything to the right or below that yellow line would have uh, uh, silicate melt present with or without a coexisting fluid phase, and conductivities in that region would have to be explained by the two together or one alone, but anywhere to the above or to the left of the yellow line uh, is subsolidus and therefore has conductivities uh, must be explained by fluids alone. The interesting thing here is that this conclusion might bring us back to explaining a long-standing problem in uh, petrology which has been that people who study granulites, especially granulites, the high grade, very highest grade rocks that uh, uh, are found in the lower crust, uh, have long understood that in some cases the water activity implied by these rocks is low, it's, but in many cases it's not so low that it would be consistent with the presence of a melt. Here's an example from the Indian granulites, uh, the granulites in South India, and uh, the confluence of all of those lines in the PT diagram which represent the uh, different equilibria indicated by the uh, minerals that are present in the rock 
Uh, they only cross, the best crossing indicating equilibrium happens when you set the activity of water of point, at point 0.5. That's higher than you would have in a, in a silicate melt at that point, uh, even at water saturation. And the interesting thing is because of the negative departures from ideality into salt water mixing, that at an activity of H2O of 0.5, corresponds to an NaCl mole fraction of b between 0.3 and 0.4, which is not especially high compared to uh, what we saw to explain the conductivity anomalies. That was right uh, among the values that would explain the conductivity anomalies. It's possible that uh, the uh, brine types of fluids are the ones that are responsible for uh, the reduced water activity so often noted in granulate metamorphic studies. Okay, so to, in the, the last minutes of this talk, I want to now go uh, even deeper. Go below the moho, down into the uh, upper mantle, all the way down to the slab, to look at the processes uh, that are happening in delivering the fluid from the slab into the mantle wedge to create the eruptions that we see, the magmas that erupted in these convergent margin settings. And the point of departure for this is the realization that if you combine pressures estimated from models of uh, current, the global current subduction system uh, at sub-arc depths with temperatures that are inferred through work by Terry Plank and, and others uh, from water cerium uh, thermometry, the slab top is at a temperature and pressure uh, shown in the green boxes for basically lo global localities in the subduction system today. They're superimp superimposed uh, onto a diagram that shows the melting of sediment, the slab sediment. So basically, these slab top uh, environments are all at just above the melting temperature uh, in the lower five boxes here or above this weird point where uh, the melting point and the, uh, the solidus ends here. And so you can see that in some subduction systems, we're actually above this. What is this point and what does it mean? Well, this is where, the, where we have critical mixing between H2O and silicate liquid so that there's a continuum of compositions possible. There's no such thing as a solidus anymore and you just have a complete change, a solubility change from zero solubility all the way up to the concentrations that you would associate with a silicate melt with no phase change in between. There's a transition between solidus present and solidus absent, it's right here. The question would be, why does that happen? Why does that weird behavior happen? And to answer that, we need to go back to well, the first conclusion that I drew, and that is that silica is among the most soluble elements. And we can learn something from uh, that conclusion here. So I'm reproducing the, the, I'm showing you again the diagram that I showed earlier, slightly redrawn, and I've added the 900 degrees C isotherm here. Experiments that have been done on this system for uh, some years ago now in a hydrothermal diamond anvil cell showed that uh, as you raise temperature and pressure at quart saturation, the water acquires more and more silica. And if you do Raman spectroscopy, you see that the, there's a very important large peak here which corresponds to the stretching mode of the silica monomer. But you can see that as temperature and pressure rise from bottom, the bottom spectrum here to the top, the, uh, there's, a, there's a growing intensity in this region and in this region right here which correspond to the silica dimer. The silica is polymerizing as pressure and temperature increase. You're get, forming bridging oxygen positions, uh, losing an OH, and uh, this is being expressed by the growth of the, the intensity in the Raman spectrum. Polymerization is strongly temperature and pressure dependent, so if we just look at, we now have thermodynamic data we can use from our solubility experiments and from Raman spectroscopy. We can calculate the thermodynamic properties of the dimer and show that at quartz saturation, uh, the, the abundance of the dimer would be along this black curve or below quartz saturation, it, di the dimer formation would be increasing like this. So basically in all of these solutions, the silica is present as two species predominantly, a monomer and a dimer. So if that's all right, we should be able to predict solubility at a range of conditions and we try that and we do 
and it works great for all, all the way up to about 800 degrees C. But at 900 degrees C, our experiments provide us with an indication that the solubility is significantly higher than uh, the predictions based solely on the monomer and the dimer. And the reason for this is because there is additional polymerization. So now we're seeing the ingrowth at these very high temperatures of a, something that must be a trimer, whether a ring or a linear chain. We can use the fact that this polymerization is happening to build a thermodynamic model for the system SO2H2O using an approach that you know, Ed Stolper used some years ago, just looking at basically the interaction between a bridging oxygen position in a, in a silicate material and molecular H2O with two hydroxyls. This is basically, of course, was interesting in that context for the speciation of water, but in this context is interesting for the, the way in which the O2 minus, the bridging oxygens in the silicate melt, are formed or unformed, okay, formed or broken. And using the thermodynamics uh, for SiO2H2O, a thermodynamic model that we built here, um, we can predict the phase diagram for H2O, SiO2. And when we do this, we predict the melting curve, which you can see here. We predict the, um, that, that it uh, moves up along this line here. And then there is a, uh, another line here that's a dash line called the critical curve, which is where liquid and vapor uh, meet and join and become one solution. And we see that um, we predict an upper critical endpoint in this thermodynamic model, which knows nothing about where anybody has ever measured quartz melting in the presence of H2O. We predict the location and the upper critical endpoint at 1067 degrees C and 9.3 kilobars. And when you compare that to what's actually been observed experimentally, it's remarkably good. 1080 degrees C and 9.5 and to 10 kilobars from uh, experiments of Kennedy and others. And we've reproduced that to just confirm it. A polymerization model, therefore, is successful at predicting solubility isopleths, which are shown in the light lines here, melting location, and the presence or absence of critical mixing uh, simply based on a, a very simple model like this. The state of the aggregation, if you will, the degree of polymerization of the silica in these solutions uh, changes. In the far left, it's mostly monomers, so if you're a person who works on Q species, this would be Q0. Uh, and uh, there is progressive polymerization that is sort of uh, increased, uh, the, the ratio of um, of OH to silica on any given, in, in the bulk solution, goes from something that's a large number, close to four here, which would be characteristic of the monomer, all the way down to zero at dry melting. Again, this is a prediction. It's not fitting uh, the, any experiments. Well, anybody who works on silicate melts knows that there's another important network forming cation that's not silicon, it's aluminum. And so what happens if we add aluminum to this system? Well, here's a set of experiments showing the solubility of corundum in pure water down at the, over on the left here. And as we add silica to the solution, you can see that the experiments shown in the red symbols indicate that the solubility of Al2O3 increases. This increases pretty profoundly up to very high values here. And the reason that this is significant is that if you look at the solubility predicted without any knowledge of anything about, uh, without including anything about polymerization, you would never see this. So the predicted solubility of corundum as a function of SiO2 concentration is shown here. Kyanite would be here, and then quartz would be here. The solubility is much, much higher. And it's entirely because of the uh, interactions between silicon and aluminum, where you simply, in the upper one here, have a substitution of aluminum for silicon to make an ALSI dimer, or something more complicated like this here. That explains the difference in solubility. If we look at a more complicated system like albite melting in the presence of paragonite, a sodium mica, uh, and, and, and quartz, we can see that the simple models, not knowing anything about polymerization, uh, predict reasonably well in the solid lines the experimental data shown in the various colors here at low temperatures at 10 kilobars here. This is total dissolved solids. This is silicon, this is aluminum, this is sodium here. But if you just pick any one of these, you can see that the predictions are reasonable at low temperatures. But as you approach the solid, as shown in the gray lines vertically here, the e experiments are showing much, much higher solubility 
than the, uh, than the uh, predictions would indicate. And again, that deviation is due to the presence of species that are not taken into account in the calculations, these polymerized species, which in fact constitute most of the dissolved solids. By the time you get to the solidus, the, sol the solution is dominated by polymerized species. The ions barely matter at all. This motivates uh, actually a fundamentally different way of thinking about hydrous melting. And this is where this comes back to Boeing. If we think about uh, the sort of albite, the wet melting of albite here, you know, we're used to thinking about, let's say, take a, an isobar and increase temperature. We'll have a, 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 albite in the presence of water will melt at this point. People rarely think about what's going on in the aqueous phase. But in fact, if you track what's happening in the aqueous phase in lo at low temperatures here, you have dominantly monomers, maybe a few dimers. As temperature increases as you approach the solidus, greater and greater degrees of polymerization are happening among the aluminum silicate constituents in the fluid phase. Eventually, you have this reaction boundary here. And if fluid's present, it will be even more polymerized. But certainly, the polymerized phase that's present after this is the melt. Hydrous melting can be seen essentially as a condensation reaction of the polymeric solutes that are dissolved in the aqueous phase. The, in some sense, the aqueous phase is foretelling the onset of melting coming, say, 50 degrees C higher temperature than the system might be at any given point by the assembly of the constituents that will polymerize to form the liquid, the silicate liquid, uh, in the aqueous phase. The chemistry in the aqueous phase is intimately linked with the melting process. And I'll just leave you with a final thought, and that is that if you have in the aqueous phase sites that are similar to those in minerals and melts that are essentially sites coordinated by oxygen rather than uh, the ions that are coordinated by H2O molecules, as in deep, shallow fluids. Then you have opportunities to dissolve much more uh, nominally refractory constituents, like zirconium. So here we have uh, results from uh, some synchrotron X-ray spectroscopy work that we've done. And uh, you can see that the um, uh, peaks that you I won't go into this in any detail, but the peaks that you see in zircon-saturated fluids uh, have similarities to uh, site environment, indicate site, uh, site similarities to site environments that you find in um, various zirconium minerals. Okay? These are oxygen coordinated sites. The zirconium is going into the solution not as a charged cation or as a hydroxide species, but as something that's par participating in these uh, polymeric types of solute structures. Okay, so. I'll uh, just uh, conclude by saying, indeed, I hope I've convinced you that there is a fundamental difference between fluids at depth from those that we might be more familiar with, uh, either in ambient conditions or in, say, geothermal systems, other shallow crustal environments. Those differences include um, alkaline pHs, somewhat higher solubilities, and uh, the presence of a dominant solute in the form of silica that's not necessarily noted in these shallower environments. The CO2 solubility, and we know, can be very, very high based on classic studies of metamorphic phase equilibria, but the, uh, this is unlikely to be the constituent that helps us understand the uh, conductivity anomalies we see in, the, in certain crustal environments. Instead, salt-rich brines are much more likely to be the, uh, the explanation for reasons that I've, uh, I hope I've convinced you of. And finally, I think that the, the key to understanding and the next step to understanding these deep fluids will be making progress on the thermodynamic properties of these aluminum silicate constituents. They hold the clues to all mass transfer in these environments. They, in fact, hold the clues to linking the behavior of the aqueous phase with the behavior of the melt. And they motivate us to think about it basically as a continuum of solvent structures from H2O to silicate liquid. Thanks for your attention. Fantastic, please. Questions? Ah, Peter. So, where might those primes be coming from now that they are going to the 
Yes, that is the question. That's always been the question with these, uh, with these brines. And stating at first that we see them in fluid inclusions, okay? So they are there. <laughs> this is not just made up. But it is uh, the sources that people have considered are things like, you know, the, the salinity that comes along with uh, burying uh, sediments, trap fluids, and so on. I think that a much more likely source, in fact, is uh, deep degassing of magmas. Um, when you consider that only 50% or so of magmas erupt in this environment, that these uh, systems are complicated plumbing systems involving multiple staging environments for magma that's not just straight shot up to the surface, every stage will involve some level of degassing. And chlorine and CO2 are both among the things that are going to leave these systems first during magmatic degassing and mix with any resident magmatic uh, um, crustal metamorphic fluid, increasing the salinity and the CO2 content, actually. A second thing is that once, even if you're out in the middle of that ternary system, uh, if you unmix, then you form one phase that's very, very salt rich and one phase that's very CO2 rich. They have very different mechanical properties, they have very different wetting properties. They will separate physically very quickly from one another and the brine itself uh, will, um, the, the, the solution then, you get a phase that's much more concentrated in the brine component through that process. So those are two paths to helping incre increase salinity in these environments. Both speculative, I mean, it's both, it's, it's, there's no evidence yet, but this is, uh, this is how I see it eventually playing out. Size fraction? So the question is what size fraction are we talking about? For example, in the ocean graph, can you talk about the dissolved phase or the soluble phase? We talk about less than 0.25 or 0.25. So are we talking about something like that? Right. So, so the question is, you know, in, in, when one does solubility, when one looks at concentrations and so on, you're, you're looking in a, in a oceanographic context or the sedimentary context, you tend to look at the fluid composition associated with different sizes of your sediment. We don't do that at high pressures and temperatures because the fluid is, is assumed to be equilibrated with the rock and size doesn't matter. So it's independent of size or volume or, or now, you know, obviously, and short time scales, if you make a myelinite or something like this through some dynamic process, uh, the solubilities locally will be significantly higher for some short time. But the duration uh, at which uh, that, the duration over which that matters is very, very short. And for most of the rocks that are exposed from these high temperature and pressure environments, we expect that they are, uh, that something close to equilibrium is a reasonable approximation. is related to the previous question. So if you think if these brines are produced by magmas crystallizing at depth at the base of the crust, do you think the amount of brine you produce is sufficient to keep all the CO2 from leaving from the magma crystallizing at the base of the crust? Because you will dissolve some CO2 in these brines. Or yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, this, this is, it, it becomes, made much more speculative than anything I've already said, which makes me uncomfortable. I don't know the answer. I, I, I really don't. I think this is an important area for us to investigate now because we're seeing evidence that these brines exist and, and we don't have a good model for how they form. You know, there's a fundamental problem here. But CO2 and, and the brine will move very much independently. The CO2 is much more likely to be trapped as fluid inclusions it stays in the system along grain boundaries, uh, whereas the brine leaves because it wets the grain boundaries and forms, it, it, so basically for the same sort of grain boundary porosity, you can get much, much higher brine mobility than the mobility of a CO2 H2O phase. So the mechanism for separation, the physical mechanism for separation has to do with the, their impact on the hydrology of the system and their, the different trapping abilities. I, I'm sorry, that's all I really can say about it.
Hi, I'm from National Institute of Geophysics, Rome, Italy. Um, did you study with your method the possibility to understand jointly the generation of earthquakes due to the fluid movement, some, some, some situation in which there are the passage from uh, a situation to another? The because in Italy, we, we have a lot of earthquakes and the role of fluids is growing in importance. Thank you very much. Right, yeah, I, I'm aware of that. And uh, of course, you know, many studies have concluded that fluid migration is a very important component of crustal seismicity in these environments. But our work does not address that at all. Our work is focused on the chemistry of the fluid phase and on what the solute load might be and on its uh, electrical, you know, to the extent that we can calculate it, the electrical properties. All right. Bernie. Oh, Bernie. Hey. There are. Uh, there are jadeite veins as well. I just showed you how to do it. It's the same thing. Okay, so uh, it's the same thing at low pressures and temperatures. You just need more fluid. But the other thing that matters will be, and this, uh, you know, this can be shown just with phase diagrams and so on. The the pH will matter, and the aluminum solubility uh, at elevated pH, you get an, a much, you get an additional kick in aluminum solubility from the anion species, the aluminate. So. And on top of that, a number of people who work in environmental geochemistry have shown that uh, very refractory compounds form these very large polymerized structures, even at ambient conditions, at extremes in pH, especially in alkaline conditions. Uh, so when you look at an acid mine drainage environment and you see iron and aluminate species flocculating out of the solution, the things that are forming are these giant cage-like structures Many of, and some of the bonding in that is this uh, bridging oxygen types of bonding. So these things are forming even at low temperatures and pressures in, in those conditions where uh, you're, you're uh, at an extreme in pH. I guess, yeah. All right, let us thank both Craig and Bernard.